Very good morning, viewers. I welcome you all on behalf, on my behalf, as well as on behalf of my colleague, Professor A. R. Khan, to this session. Today's topic of discussion is agrarian system under the Delhi Sultans. Uh, this uh, discussion is, is going to be, we are going to spread it into two sessions. Uh, one session which is right now 11 to 11.45. The second session would be after 15 minutes break from 12 to 12.45. In these two sessions, we are going to discuss the entire agrarian system as it worked under the Delhi Sultans. The major components of the agrarian uh, policies that we are going to, or, or system that we are going to discuss uh, would be, uh, first component would be the agrarian production, agricultural production, then the nature and pattern of land revenue extraction, and who were the intermediaries or through which uh, process or through which machinery the state was extracting the land revenue and what was the impact, overall impact of the entire agrarian policies of the Delhi Sultan on the agrarian economy. So all these components we are going to discuss in uh, these two sessions. As far as uh, with the establishment of the Delhi uh, Sultanate, a new, a sort of new political ideas and political institution came into fore. Though the historians have viewed uh, the um, Delhi Sultanate from different perspectives. If we see uh, Lalan, Professor Lalanji Gopal has emphasized that with the coming of the Delhi Sultans, the party in India begins. Similarly, Professor K.S. Lal has emphasized that with the coming of the Delhi Sultans or the Turks, it is the India's population reduced to one third. The another perspective that is presented by Professor Muhammad Habib, he is speaking about the changes uh, that were brought out by the uh, Delhi Sultans were so drastic that he is uh, using the word urban revolution and rural revolution in this, in this context. So important point that Muhammad Habib is uh, pointing out that uh, as far as the Delhi Sultanate is concerned, it was not just mere continuation of the old system. There were certain changes that were being brought during the, uh, by the Turks uh, that he calls for that he is using the word revolution. Now, since in this session we are going to discuss the entire agrarian system, the most important uh, component uh, that we have to bear in mind is that if we uh, see any pre-industrial uh, society or, pre or all medieval societies, whether it's the, in India or Europe, all medieval societies were largely agrarian societies. When we say that these were the agrarian societies, we mean that agriculture was the major activity um, uh, was the major and as well as when it agriculture was the major activity it was also the major source of states income so the important aspect uh, uh, related to this uh, as far as uh, uh, land revenue system agricultural production is concerned that uh, that the land when we would be discussing about the production and revenue imposition that you have to bear in mind that the state when it imposed the land revenue it was never a revenue on the land it was never a rent rather it was a uh, an imposition or extraction on the produce of the land. So these important things that we have to bear in mind. So to begin with, uh, let us start that what was the nature and pattern of the agricultural production, whether the same thing, same types of crops, agricultural production continued, or whether certain changes were being brought about by the Delhi Sultan. It would be interesting if Professor uh, Khan can throw some light on the pattern of the nature of agricultural production. Professor Khan, please. 
Thank you, Abba. <coughs> and good morning, viewers. Agrarian system of the Delhi Sultans. That is our topic for today's discussion. Agrarian system, as you must have had an idea by Abba's introduction, we, by agrarian system we mean the overall system of economy which was dependent on agriculture. In this we, we, we take into account what was agriculture like, how much land was under cultivation or under the plow, what produce, uh, production system was uh, in operation, what, how were the, uh, that production of the land was utilized, how the total income generated through the production was distributed among various groups and which were the major classes or personnel who were involved in overall agricultural production and appropriation of the surplus of agricultural production. So these are some of the things which we propose to discuss in this session today. Let us start with the extent of cultivation. What was the land under the plow? Can we have a real estimate about the Delhi Sultanate? That is the period from around the beginning of the 13th century to the middle of the 15th, uh, 16th century around. Uh, classically, to 1200 to 1526 period is called the period of the Delhi Sultans. During this period, it is very difficult to est estimate the exact land which was under the plow. We can have just an idea that uh, if we compare it with the uh, figures available for the later period or the territories which were inhabited or the number of villages, there can be a number of indicators to suggest whether land was increasing or not, but it is difficult to say exactly how much land was under cultivation at that time. A rough estimate, uh, a rough idea can be had from overall land revenue. We have those figures also available for the Sultan of period that how much revenue was collected. Then we have an idea that how much uh, that will give us an idea total produce because we know that 50 percent was collected as land revenue. So we know what must have been the total production estimate and that will give us a rough estimate. But uh, still we are not sure. Another indication of the extent of cultivation we get is from the references to clearance of forest. We notice that large tracts even in Indo-Gangetic Doab were under the forest. While in the 16th century and 17th century we notice all this area under cultivation and that la land area is under the forest during the Sultanate period. So that gives an idea that large portions of land in the Indo-Gangetic Doab and other such territories wherever we get references to forests were not cleared for cultivation. So this uh, uh, gives us a rough idea that still the land was available. There was not too much pressure on the land. The third important point through which we come to know about this is through a early 13th century uh, text which refers to what are the requirements for a peasant to produce and the author lists three major things availability of seed with the peasant, availability of equipments with the peasant, how much equipment is available, what seeds are available and whether the peasant has oxygen or animals to kill the land. So, but you would notice that there is no reference that the land is also a must. It gives an indication that land was probably in abundance. There was no shortage of land. Land was available and other three things were needed. That is the animals to till the land, seeds to sow the land and implements to work on the land. So that means that land is more per person or the availability of land is not a problem but this is also uh, supported by the regulations made about peasantry not to desert their lands. Peasants were expected to work on their land, they were not allowed to run away from the lands and if they ran away they were supposed to be restored back on the land on which they were working. So these things give an idea that land was there 
available in surplus and the issue was that cultivators should be there. So that means land is more as compared to the population and therefore it is in surplus. So we can say safely say that the land under cultivation was gradually being increased that we notice by 17th century more and more land is brought under the plough. That is one aspect of it. Now the second point which uh, I propose to discuss is what were the things which were produced on the land. Again 13th century sources tell us about one of the uh, Thakur Feru lists around 25 crops during that period which were produced in the land. And how these crops were major crops we can list down they can be categorized into two or three categories that we will come to uh, in a little while. Before that the, we have references of two major crop seasons Kharif and Ravi. They are two major crop seasons when it is planted. In the Ravi crop we have crops like wheat, barley, gram etc. and in the Kharif we have major crop as rice and other uh, grains and pulses etc. So that these are two major crops which occupy the land. Overall if we try to classify the crops grown we can have number one food crops. So that was one of the major items which were grown. Food crops were cultivated all through the Sultanate without any exception depending on the availability of water in the area, type of soil and all that peasants were using more dominant crops. In food crop we can list wheat, rice, barley, jowar, jow and pulses of different types, gram of course, these were some major food crops. Second classification of crops we use is cash crops. The crops which were giving more money to the producer and which were not only used for food purposes but they were used apart from fruit for other craft productions and all. In this category we can have four major crops in this period. One is sugarcane, opium, cotton and indigo. These four, are four major crops can be classified in the category of cash crops. Then we have third type of agricultural produce that is fruits during that period. Uh, fruits uh, most common through all sources which refer to is mango. Apart from mango, a large number of other crops like fruits like kharbuz, tarbuza, jamun, beer and all a host of food uh, fruits were available. But the major point of uh, the food crops was that these were produced through seed mainly. No advanced technologies of fruit cultivation or improving the quality of food fruits was available. We will come to that in uh, when we talk about the major impacts or new changes brought about. Interesting uh, thing that uh, you referred about Thakkar Feru. Thakkar Feru refers a lot number of crops as you were discussing. But it is very interesting that indigo as you were just mentioned, you have just mentioned that was an important crop. It is not mentioned by Thakkar Feru. Uh, it is very, very uh, important. I don't know how aspect. he missed out on that, but he has not listed. What is significant to notice here is that five or six more important crops which are today found in almost every region of India are altogether missing in the crops during the period of Delhi Sultanate. What are these crops which came to India during 16th century or later? They are maize, makka is one crop which was not produced in India before 16th century. Another one is tobacco. Tobacco is also among the cash crops is not noticed during the Sultanate period. Similarly, potato or aloo which is so common in India these days was not being produced during the Sultanate period. It came from outside. Even tomato and, uh, introduced tomato, much later. Tomato, chili and groundnut. 
So these six major crops which are so common to India nowadays were not available during the period of Delhi Sultanate and they were introduced gradually by various people coming from outside, some from Latin America as potato reached all over the world through that route and similarly chilies and maize is a doubtful origin how it came to India but it definitely came during 16th century only. How much yield was there per acre or per bigha is difficult. Uh, before you, uh, we switch on that, uh, Professor Khan, would you like to speak something about an, an important crop that was introduced, sericulture? Would you like to throw some... Yeah, sericulture was also uh, prevalent mainly some territories, some region, mainly in Bengal or parts of Kashmir. Sericulture is a, a silk... Uh, as you know, sericulture is the process through which silk is produced and the uh, cocoons or the silk worm as we call them, they are fed on the mulberry trees and that sericulture was also one of the important agricultural produce if one may link that. It is a, a agriculture plus a sort of a, a craft where human intervention is required for raiding the worms and then uh, reusing the worms for getting the silk thread and finally making the silks. Yeah, but interesting, interesting point is that uh, it's not that the silk was not known. Eri, Tassar and Munga was very much known to the Indians. Yeah, India. But only through the mulberry, uh, production through the mulberry was uh, not at known the 14th, 15th yeah. century we had uh, introduced only in the Bengal. mulberry region. tree silk worms were introduced during the Sultanate period. So that is an important produce though limited in certain territories and that continued to be limited even during the 16th and 17th century in specific regions only. As far as the total produce is concerned, how much was the produce per viga, it is very difficult to estimate because we do not have figures for that period. We just have an idea that uh, uh, how much uh, was charged in certain territories per viga, the money charged wherever we have very scanty references and that shows average yields and not specific yields per bigha. One can assume that uh, preference was for cash crops but these cash crops growing needed more investment in terms of water, in terms of providing um, manure and khad etc. for growing them and they uh, the seed even were more expensive and if there was any loss then loss was greater in case of cash crops and only those peasants were able to grow cash crops who had more land than their personal requirement of food so that that uh, is there third important component which I would like to discuss uh, in this session is about the irrigation how was the irrigation done for the agricultural production. Of course, rainwater was the major source of all irrigation <coughs> and all territories had abundant crops during rainy seasons. But apart from that, there were a number of other sources of irrigation. Second most popular was wells. Wells both kacha and pakka wells. Machinery wells were called pakka wells or kacha wells. There were Kacha wells were used where the water table was very high and one need not dig very deep and if you are digging very deep then you need to have masonry well so that land does not caves in and you have regular supply of water. So these wells were used. Third important source was tanks of water or at some places some dams were erected through mud deposits so that that water can be used when there are no rains for irrigation purposes. What is most important during Sultanate period, most significant thing is that we get a number of techniques for lifting water from the wells. That is, earlier there was a method through which a wheel was used to lift water from the open surfaces. This wheel was, had the pots attached to the rim of the wheel and then when you circulate it then water from the open surface or ditches can be collected through that and directed for irrigation. But the most important 
innovation or a new technology entering was through a Persian wheel or rahat or arghatta, what we call, is an important device through which water from the depth can be lifted with the help of a chain of buckets, earthen buckets or leather buckets, which were later on converted into metallic uh, buckets attached, metallic pots attached to that chain. But that was much later. In the whole period, medieval period, we have these earthen or leather uh, pots attached to the wheel. A chain of pots going deep into the well and through horizontal and vertical motions, two wheels operating and what we call a pin drum mechanism or uh, axle through which water was lifted. Later on, animal power was also used to lift this water. So this was a major innovation, a major new technology introduced in India during this period and helped in the irrigation. Another major uh, innovation... And the, so, sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, what Professor Khan is speaking about, the Persian wheel, we call earlier, we, the, what uh, the previous technology that Professor yeah. Khan is, is was speaking about was uh, we uh, ref get the reference of Ghati Yantra. So without the gear mechanism, it was the Ghati, Ghati Yantra yeah. that was called. And this, uh, the important aspect that you are referring to is that how the horizontal motion was converted, converted into, into vertical, vertical motion and it helped in the sub water, continuous water supply, Slow that was continuous depth. water flow. So the big fields could now be irrigated and the important aspect that you have emphasized on that how from the greater depth uh, because of the Persian wheel it was possible to uh, extract now water with the help of the animal power but historians uh, differ on this point I'm I just wanted to, to <laughs> the of time. Uh, they say that time. whether the Persian wheel actually brought the um, uh, the prosperity in the Punjab region and it is uh, uh, possible to have uh, yeah. the uh, Persian wheel was successful in the where the water table is much deeper uh, but if Anabi we still uh, accept that it is it was a great device and it was responsible for the uh, prosperity of the Punjab region please continue Another important irrigational device which is uh, introduced during the Sultanate period is the uh, making of the canals. Firoz Tughlaq, one of the Delhi Sultans, is credited with starting a number of canals from Yamuna and really large canals and a uh, Yamuna, Kosi, Ghaghar, various rivers were used to carve out canals from them and whole of Punjab and Multan region had a uh, sort of a network of canals which helped in overall increasing the productivity in many regions which were not under cultivation could be brought under cultivation through that. I have given you a very brief picture of all these and would not go into the further details of agricultural technology and production because we but have limited time. But important aspect about the medieval canal is that they were the natural canals and uh, that's why you find when the British canals came and you will find that a lot of havoc was created uh, during that period. So that is important point uh, to yeah, make is that's that, a no. natural canals. You can continue please. That's all. I, I no, I, I would like uh, if you can uh, emphasize little bit on the how uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq uh, ho uh, reorganized the entire uh, agricultural production process. If you can okay, say I, something I, I, on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Actually, now the question is whether a state was taking any direct interest in the, in the agricultural production or the overall uh, scenario of agriculture. We noticed that most of the sultans were only focusing on getting more and more land revenue rather than paying any attention really to intervene in the overall agricultural process. It is for the first time that a Sultan like Muhammad Tughlaq who directly intervened and gave some inputs as a state policy and his interventions I will give very briefly because we don't have much time we have lot to discuss in this session 
three major things Mohammad Tughlaq does. One is that he establishes a department of agriculture, that is Diwan e Kohi. For the first time earlier, there was no separate uh, wing to look after the uh, agricultural production, though there were wings which will look after the revenue collection or the uh, income from the land, but uh, directly helping through this department was an important thing and they gave grants to cultivators for various requirements and these were called Sondhar in the earlier phase, later on we use a term called Takavi, uh, Takavi means to give strength, to give support to the agricultural process and why was this required? It was required because of the famines, at times uh, crops will fail or at times during war uh, crops will be destroyed or for, for various reasons uh, cultivators needed money to raise crops so these were advanced loans called Takavi by the state and it is estimated that around 20 million tankas were given by Mohammad Tughlaq for this purpose uh, for uh, agricultural production. And the third important thing uh, Mohammad Tughlaq did was that he gave through the Iwane Kohi suggestions and all and instructions that uh, peasants should move from inferior to superior crops. Say for example he said we should try to cultivate wheat among the food crops and in place of wheat we should cultivate sugar cane to, from barley which is a coarse uh, food crop to wheat from wheat to sugar cane from sugar cane to fruits like grapes and dates so that is to improve overall productivity and income and produce from the field so these were some of the measures of uh, Muhammad Tughlaq which he directly state took interest. So I won't go into more details now because time is limited and I would request Dr. Abha to have a word about beyond agricultural production other activities. Thank you Professor Khan. Uh, Professor Khan has just spoke uh, about uh, the agricultural production nature and pattern how it worked, which were the new crops that were, that were being introduced. Now, the, another important component uh, of the agrarian system is that what were the pattern, uh, nature and pattern of the, the assessment and extraction of the land revenue. I would like to focus a little bit on, uh, on, on this aspect of assessment and extraction of the revenue under the Delhi Sultans. The important uh, point, first point rather, I would like to mention that we do not get the detailed information as far as the land revenue, pattern of land revenue assessment or extraction is concerned. We get the fragmentary references here and there and to piece together we have tried, historians have tried to, uh, to come to a certain conclusion that what were the, the system of assessment and revenue extraction was possibly in operation during the, under the Delhi Sultans. Now, uh, as, far, uh, as far as the initial years of the Delhi Sultanate, Sultanate establishment of the Delhi Sultanate is concerned, uh, if we, uh, I can call them the early Delhi Sultans, uh, we do not uh, accept that the reference that Minhaj Siraj historian of Ilitut Mishrain, he mentions about that how the revenue was extracted, uh, uh, was being extracted in the form of the tribute, the Ranas, Ra Rautas and the Rajas, Rais, he uses the word, were being subdued and they were being asked to pay a summary, uh, a, a lump sum amount in the form of the tribute. So probably the early Delhi Sultans, Iltutmish and Balban were more focused, were in more uh, interested first to consolidate the political gains of the Delhi Sultanate and they could not get much time to penetrate into um, the rural areas. So most likely till the pre Alauddin Khalji's reign, it was more or less the uh, revenue was extracted in the form of the, the tribute. Uh, we do not get beyond this any 
preference. Now coming to the the suddenly during uh, the Alauddin Khalji's reign, we get the testimony of Ziauddin Barney. Ziauddin Barney mentions that Alauddin Khalji imposed the one half of the produced as taxation uniformly on all and for that he ordered the measurement and per biswa he has decided the revenue that was half of the produce to be given to the state. What uh, we can derive from the statement of Bernie there are four important points that Bernie is mentioning. First important point he is referring to that the taxation was imposed uniformly on all classes, all rural classes. The second point he was he, he has referred to that the measurement, he ordered for the measurement of the land. This is very, very important. And once, the third important point he is referring to that once the measurement is done, per biswa means per unit of the a area was being assessed that how much the yield on different crops per unit of the area was then it was being multiplied to the total area cultivated in a particular crops and accordingly to they have arrived at what would be the half of the produce that they were supposed to pay to the state. So these are the important points that uh, Ziauddin Bani was uh, pointing out so that Alauddin Khalji have imposed half of the produce uniformly measurement was being brought into and as a result, uh, Bernie uses the word uh, that uh, he has introduced these measures so that the burden of the strong should not fall upon the weak. We will come to this point a little later. Professor Khan would like to speak something on that. Uh, but uh, Alauddin Khalji has imposed one half of the produce. But along with this land revenue, he abolished all other taxes but he, he, Bernie also refers that he imposed two more taxes that is ghari that was a uh, house tax and the second was the charai that was the grazing tax. This was also imposed uniformly. After Bernie, we, after uh, Alauddin Khalji's reign, we do not get much of the information than during Muhammad bin Tughlaq again Bernie refers that Muhammad bin Tughlaq imposed the revenue so rigorously and he has enhanced the revenue in the proportion of 1 to 10 to 1 to 20. We are not sure that whether it is just a rhetoric in which the Bernie is referring to but uh, he is referring to uh, to the enhancement during Muhammad bin Tughlaq's reign. Apart from Barney, another authority during Muhammad bin Tughlaq's reign who refers about uh, uh, the land revenue system of the, of, uh, as it was in operation during Muhammad bin Tughlaq's reign was Yahya bin Ahmad Sarhindi. He refers to two important points. One, he says that the ghari and charai were being imposed so rigorously that he asked the um, officials to check each and or to count each and every house. So the rigor was there. Ghari and Charai, as we I have just mentioned, that were in operation, were imposed by Alauddin Khalji also. So the rigor was there in Ghari and Charai. The second important aspect that Yahya bin Ahmad Sir Hindi was speaking about was that the uh, he is using the word the Persian terminology that he has used that the while extracting the land revenue he has used the wafahae farmani that means the officially decreed yields and nirake farmani that officially decreed prices so he had arrived at the um, one half of the produce on the basis of the officially decreed yields and officially decreed prices. On the basis of Yahya's testimony, Fan Habib uh, concludes that probably it was not 
the the um, uh, revenue was probably continued to be half of the produce but the, it was the rigor with which mohammed bin tughlaq Uh, imposed that was one of the reason for the hardship of the um, of the uh, um, peasants so because uh, the officially decreed prices and officially decreed yields were naturally much much higher uh, as compared to the um, uh, to the of, uh, to the actual uh, yields and actual power, uh, actual prices that were in operation So, Dr. Abba, I think we need to slightly elaborate on this point. Uh, say, for example, what uh, is final distinction between what Alauddin was doing and what Muhammad Tughlaq did, so that there was a hue and cry. Uh, so, as you said, Irfan Abi feels that it was uh, mainly the rigors of collection, and why it became rigorous for collection. Standard deal. Standard deal. So, what is actually what was happening under Alauddin Khalji when he brought under uniform cultivation? What is happening is that the actually land is being measured and actual yield is being observed. What is the upaj or yield of that area? And that can be different for irrigated land, non-irrigated land, and all yield will differ. And actual yield, then they will decide that 50 percent will take. And what Muhammad Tughlaq is doing? it is very difficult for a state to constantly monitor the lands where actually it is being produced how much being produced and then do it so it was convenient for them that sitting on their offices they can say yield is this much officially declared that uh, wheat will be 3 months per bigha and then officially you estimate actual yield might be only 1 and a half bigha months so that way if you officially estimate and fix that will be much higher and peasants will not be able to pay that's why the peasants were the great sufferers and the devastation and because, because we talk about it uh, uh, professor khan will div, uh, discuss about the, there was because of uh, all these uh, policies of mohammed bin tughlaq you all know that there was a great uprising of uh, in the of the peasants uh, in the region of the doab that will point will come little later so uh, the important aspect uh, that professor khan and i was discussing that how the, it was the rigor and the official uh, decreed prices and yield probably were the major reason for the um, for the uh, greater suppression on ex of the peasants and that's why the uprising then uh, after mohammed bin tughlaq then uh, we come uh, to uh, the references that we know about is uh, from the reign of firoz tughlaq firoz tughlaq did, did try to ease out uh, little bit what mohammed bin tughlaq did and he abolished all the cesses uh, confining it to 4% and the important the change that he brought about in the uh, structure of the the land revenue was that up till now till firoz tughlaq's reign uh, the land revenue that was the word the persian terminology that was used for land revenue was kharaj o jizya now he separated kharaj that is land revenue and jizya along with this he abolished ghari and charai that the two major taxes that were being uh, imposed by alauddin khalji continued under mohammed bin tughlaq so he abolished professor irfan habib uh, believes that uh, what firoz tughlaq did was uh, that it was uh, jizya was introduced in the form of new tax but it was not bringing additional burden in the sense because probably the jizya was replacing the gharai uh, the ghadi that is the house tax because jizya was uh, with jizya uh, the women and children were exempted and it was uh, imposed on per house basis per individual from the individuals uh, individual house so uh, it was probably uh, replacing uh, the the ghari uh, tax itself so these are the major changes that firoz brought the another thing abolition yes. of charai was very important if we see yes because, because the cattle were large number and the charai was realized on the per cattle because these cattle were using common lands for grazing their animals so every animal was charged once you abolish that a lot relief gets common. to the peasants that they don't have to pay for their animals any separate 
and even cesses reducing cesses only up to the 4% was a big uh, and during as uh, you uh, professor khan was discussing that how during uh, 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 firoz shah tughlaq's reign a huge system of canal was introduced it was also uh, great it provided great impetus as far as the extension of uh, agriculture is concerned but he introduced uh, because uh, once the canals were introduced a uh, a tax uh, hakesha and uh, but this uh, tax was introduced uh, uh, or imposed only on those areas where the canals were running so largely firoz shah tughlaq's canals were in the area of haryana modern haryana so probably this uh, tax was uh, extracted from uh, the region haryana region where the firoz shah's canals were so these are the important changes that were being brought by by firoz tughlaq but one important point uh, uh, that uh, mm, uh, it was introduced uh, mm, uh, from uh, alauddin khalji's reign that the state extracted the land revenue preferred the extraction of land revenue in cash for this we get uh, the mm, references contrary references in barney itself i am referring again and again to ziauddin barney because ziauddin barney is the main authority on during uh, on this uh, period ziauddin barney says on the one side referring to uh, in a one reference that on account of uh, uh, since the state uh, imposed uh, and extracted the revenue um, in with so rigor and demanded uh, in cash with so rigor that Uh, they were uh, peasants were actually uh, uh, finding it difficult to pay and they had to sell off their grain entirely immediately after the ha harvest so that they can pay it in the cash this indicates that the cash was demanded the state was demanding uh, the revenue in cash but uh, referring to the doab region barney says that the alauddin khalji preferred to ex, uh, have the revenue in the form of grain so these are the two contrasting statement but the second sta generally um, uh, we presume that the land revenue was state pref state's preference was cash but the second statement that bernie is say mentioning with specific reference to the doab region where if we uh, take into account alauddin khalji's market control policy to check the prices he had to have a huge stock of the granary that's why his preference for the uh, to to have the taxation in the form of grain to fill his granary that was uh, uh, actually um, it uh, seems that what barney is saying about the state's preference for cash collection is correct because we have a number of other uh, evidence to support that because it's the pressure on peasant to immediately sell the crop uh, why would they immediately want to sell because they won't get good price when there is abundance of crop but they had to because they will be paying cash another thing is the the prevalence and large presence of banjaras who were handling uh, the trade in grain uh, they were buying all the grain from village to village it shows that they were actually buying from the village itself from the source where they were being produced so it seems that uh, major policy was to get in cash but in doaba and area around delhi because of the market control as you said control policy the the it was collected in kind so that it can be supplied to the markets for sale i think now I time think is over i think the important uh, just one point i would like to add was that uh, when we come to uh, during the late uh, lodi uh, sayed and lodis we get the reference uh, tariq e daudi clearly says that the lodi sultan had to uh, switch over to uh, extraction of grain in kind 
wine instead of cash. So this also confirms what Professor Khan you were saying uh, that the uh, prior to the, 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 the Lodi Sultans, it was the revenue was extracted in cash and not in kind. Uh, thank you, viewers. We will continue our this uh, discussion on the agrarian system of the Delhi Sultan uh, after 15 minutes at 12 o'clock. Be with us. Thank you very much.